Check, check. One, two, one, two. <laughs> Baby, I was born this way. Oh, I got that song in my head, too, since the Super Bowl. <laughs> Welcome to AT Banter, the podcast where we discuss anything and everything regarding the world of assistive technology. With our hosts, Steve Barkley, Rob Minot, and Ryan Fleury. Now, let's banter. Hey, and welcome to hey. another episode of AT Banter. With your host. Rob Minow. And Ryan Flurry. Well, look at us. It's changing it up today. <laughs> Just when everybody thought they knew the, the right. opening, we threw you a curveball. Surprise! Uh, we have no Steve Barkley with us this week. He nope. is off again. He's sick. He is sick. He's He's got a cold. Uh, yeah. He's had a he's had a cold for a while. It's well that cold that's going around that yeah. was going around this year it was a nasty one. Mm-hmm. I still know people that are still coming down with it and are still recovering from it. I know it. Yeah, yeah, it's hanging on. I've been lucky. I haven't got it yet. So, no nope. knock on wood. I was sick over Christmas while I was off, but I I every year I'm usually sick over Christmas, but this year I managed to dodge the bullet and yeah. I was not. So uh, so far, yeah, I guess my. My diet of Pop-Tarts and cinnamon <laughs> buns are really working wonders for my immune system. Excellent. Uh, hey, so what are we doing today, Ryan? Today we are talking with Marty Schultz from Blindfold Games. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. It's going to be interesting to talk to uh, an app developer. I've often wondered about about what it's like to develop apps. Yeah, and he's got a really great selection of games. Uh, he's obviously been doing this a little while, so... Yeah, I've been looking at the research, and he's very prolific, that's mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. So, all right, well then, you know, with without any further ado, let's uh, let's go ahead and reach out and, and get him on. All righty. All right. So we're really happy to be talking today to Marty Schultz, who is the founder of Blindfold Games, uh, which is a company that... An app developer that creates apps, um, games, uh, specifically for visually impaired people. Well, thank you for inviting me. Great. Thanks for thanks for joining us. So tell us, I, I guess maybe we'll start by giving us a little bit of a background into you. Um, are, were you, like, did you go to school as for, a, for app development? Uh, what's your background? Uh, I've been like a serial software entrepreneur pretty much my whole life. I'm semi-retired now. Um, I've started at least six different companies, did pretty well from some of them. Um, so I, w- I actually got into building apps about six or seven years ago. Um, and I built a couple for some friends of mine. One was an app for salsa dancing. Another was an app for like a math program. Um, but... I remember when my daughter was about 11 years old or so, she was working on her birthday wish list. And every day she would come out with a new new list of what she would want for her birthday. And I thought there should be an app for that. <laughs> so I thought I could either create this app and then focus group, test it with some of her friends, or I could use this as a STEM learning opportunity for some of the kids at her school. So I went to the headmaster and I said, look, I want to run a little after school club. Uh, we'll have... Uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh graders attend the club. We'll meet three times a week. I'll need an hour. We'll probably do this about six weeks. And I'll basically teach the kids how to design the app. And I'll actually do the programming. So we set about building out this app that we called Wish to List, where kids would end up putting in what they wanted for their birthday or a holiday. And then when the, every day the kid could change it or share it with their friends. And when they were completely done, they could send the list to the parents and the parents would know what to get the kid. Well, we ended up building the app. It was you know, the kids had a great time designing it. Um, it was a complete flop in the app store. But anyway, um, the kids did learn how to do how to design and, and learn a little about the whole process of building software. The head of the headmaster came back to me and she asked me, would I be willing to run the app club again? And by the way, can I teach the middle school kids programming right after I drop my daughter off every morning? Mm-hmm. So I agreed to both of those. And when we set to meet out the app club the second time the kids said they wanted to build a game and I said well if I'm going to do the programming for a game it has to be a game that's different from all the other million games on the app store and I sent them off and two weeks later they came back and they didn't have any ideas that, that were original 
So I was thinking I didn't want to have to actually hire a graphic artist. And I was thinking about what we could do without needing a graphic artist. And I decided, well, let's do a blunt, a driving game where you don't have to look at the screen. And then thinking a little further is let's do a driving game for blind people. And I said, the way it'll work is if you drive too far to the left or right, the music will get louder in either your left ear or the right ear where the music represents the fence at the side of the road. And the kids didn't really understand that. So I took one of the, the boys and I put him in the middle of the room. And then I took a girl, um, again, of like a fifth or sixth grader, put her at one end of the room, put a blindfold around her. And I said, OK, the boy, you pretend to be a cow and you say moo, moo, moo continually. And the girl, you have to walk up to the boy and then walk around him without bumping into him. Mm-hmm. And they went through that exercise and they realized, yes, it's possible to navigate around without using your eyes. So I said, okay, that's how the game's going to work. When you hear the, the things in your left ear, it means you're getting, you're, you're the object is to your left and vice versa. So once the kids got that, we spent the next two or three weeks kind of designing the general framework and how to steer the, the car and so forth. And then we start building one level after another. And the idea that each level of this game would be a little more complex than the prior level. So initially, there's just driving your car on the road and not bumping into a fence. Then we make the road curve a little to the right. Then we put animals in the middle of the road so you don't bump into them. And then we put prizes on the road. And after about six months or so, we had built about 35 different levels of this game, which was called Blindfold Racer. And... Uh, I then finally tested it. At this point, I had never met a blind person, but I I finally tested it at the Lighthouse for the Blind in Miami. And on one Saturday, it was like a teen afternoon, and the teens absolutely loved the game and had lots of great suggestions for the game, such as one of them asked me, "Um, is the screen blank when you're, you're playing this game? And I said, yes. He said, well, when sighted people play the game and the screen is blank, they're going to think their iPad is broken, so you need to put something on the screen. So we did that and we implemented a couple of other of their suggestions and then tested it again with them and a few other lighthouses down in South Florida. And then finally released it in the App Store, I think, in February of 2014. And it quickly jumped to the top of the list for best games out of Apple Viz. Wow. And, you know, I think like a month or two later, I was contacted by some of the people at the uh, American Council for the Blind and some people over at Perkins and the Carroll School. And they asked me the next time I'm in Boston, because I go back to Boston a lot, can I stop by and meet with them? And I agreed to, and uh, I was supposed to meet them at the Carroll School, uh, but it ended up being he was taking that day off. He had a bunch of visitors in from town. I met him at his house. So I met Ryan Charlson, who works at the Carroll School, who's married to Kim Charlson, who was the, was the president of the ACB at the time, and Judy Dixon, who runs the Talking Book Program for the National Library of Congress. And they had actually been up all night playing blindfold racers. So that when I got there the next morning, um, not only were their dogs really, really tired from being up all night with them, but they had lots of suggestions on the game and lots of things about how to make a, a game that has a lot of physicality to it, has an excellent soundscape to it. And then Judy asked me at that time, can I make a Sudoku game? And somebody else asked me to make the cryptogram game. And I did both of those. And it just amazed me that Judy can play a nine by nine Sudoku game without, <laughs> you know, being able to see the, 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 the puzzle. Yeah. Then I, I was over at Perkins and I met Joanne Becker, and she had just gotten back from a trip in Las Vegas with one of her colleagues, where he was telling her what the cards were. And she asked me to make a blackjack game, and I did that and collaborated with her. And then it was just like one game after another. So here we are, roughly three years later, and I think I'm about seventy games. Wow. 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 So it really took off. So, I mean, it sounds like, I mean, did you, were you, were you kind of shocked at, at the trajectory that, that things went, you know, from, from being, you know, sort of a a project at your daughter's school to, to this, I mean, it must be a pretty big surprise. Yeah, it was, I mean, the the hard, there are two hard things. There's one coming up with, with what game to build next that will be sufficiently popular. And then secondly, how to create a business out of this that while it doesn't pay me any money, has enough money in there for marketing to be able to get the word out to more and more people about it. Right now, I think the numbers I've heard there are somewhere between 30,000 and 50,000 uh, visually impaired people in America who are considered legally blind and they own an iPhone or an iPad. 
Well, only about one fifth of those people know about my games. Right. So my challenge really is to ha how do I get the word out effectively about the games and let people know that they're there. Um, so that continues to be a challenge. You know, I, I go to the last year I went to the the National Braille. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, uh, the NFB show in Orlando. I went to uh, a couple of eight small ACB shows. I'm actually going out to CSUN next, in about three weeks. Right. Um, I went to an AER show back in September, I think, where there are a lot of TVIs, and I figured that would be a good way to good way to get the word out. I have about ten thousand or so people on my mailing list. I'm a member of about 30, 25 to thirty Facebook groups, <laughs> and I try to I do a blog like once or twice a week. So. I try to keep the word out there, but it's still hard to find everybody. Well, it's it's tough too because historically nothing like this has existed, and so people just kind of assume that they don't, these things don't exist. It, it, it's a, an amazing. What's also interesting is how much different an accessible game is from a game that's actually designed uh, for someone who's visually impaired. And and I, it's taken me you know years to learn how to do things right. And, and this, I have about a group of 25 to 50 testers who are all blind, some blind from birth, some blind as adults. Um, but the feedback they give me is just really insightful because I'll sometimes make an assumption that, that even if you can't see the screen, you can still do something, and then I find that's completely wrong. Um, remember when I was doing basketball, and I wanted to use a gesture to tell the difference between two types of basketball shots. I think one would, would be the gesture of the letter V, and which would be a, a downstroke from the left to the right, followed by an upstroke from the right to the left. And then the other type of shot would be a check mark, which is the same shape, but the downstroke is much shorter than the upstroke. Well, I put it out there, and then I was getting reports back from people saying their gestures aren't working properly. And I, it took me like hours before I realized they were using one gesture or my, my code that would evaluate the gestures would, would not be able to distinguish between the two because people could not judge whether their upstroke and their downstrokes were the same distance unless they kept another finger or something else on the screen, right. um, which you know, being sighted, I would just not have thought about. But as soon as I closed my eyes and I tried it, I had the same limitation. So I ended up, you know, changing it simply to say whether it starts on the left or the right. And it's in those type of um, discussions I have with people where I'll put something out there and then I'll get beat up by people, you know, complaining how, how what a bad choice I made. And then I fix it and then it moves ahead. So um, sometimes, sometimes it's a matter of, of understanding exactly what's going on to be able to build something that is both – accessible and easy to play. I mean, there's a big difference I've noticed in games that are simply market, marketed as accessible because they inevitably are really slow to play. So first you have to, you know, first you find the button, then you have to double tap the, you know, tap the button to get it to say its name and then double tap it to affect the button. And that's just, it really slows down what should be a fast game. So in all my games, I've tried whenever, whenever possible to use gestures and make sure those gestures are identical through all the games or have very similar meaning. Right. Well, and so having developed, you know, sort of non-accessible games and now accessible games, can you give us an idea of like how is the development process different between the two? Um, well, you don't have to worry about what the screen looks like when you're building a not, I mean, <laughs> right? you know, an accessible game, which actually not only can that be very, very expensive. I mean, the best games out there spend as much money on programmers as they have on visual artists or audio engineers, um, but so much money is put into a pleasant visual experience that I don't have to worry about that. And that takes a lot of talent to do a good visual experience. I only have to worry about a very good audio experience, so I spend a lot of time. First, I'll build out a game with just the gestures involved, and then I'll go back to the, the testers and say, okay, what kind of audio scape do you want above and beyond the background music? So when we did... Uh, the game called Road Trip, which is similar to 1,000 Miles on Mealborn, depending on what you did. I would add, I had somebody actually collect about 25 different audio clips, and I added them to the game. So when you, you go 100 miles in your car, it plays the sound of a car speeding very fast, or if you stop, you hear the brakes squeal. I just did, a, then about six months ago, I did a sailing version of that, and then about a month ago, I did a train version of that. 
And by making a one-to-one -one relationship between what's happening in the game and additional sounds you hear, it gives the game a much more interesting flavor. There are some games I remember when I did horse race, blindfold horse race, I just have to, I was, I think I was looking or I had played a little with um, the something else game, um, Papa Sangri, and I, I like the way you walked on the screen with your fingers, and I thought, I can make a horse racing game where you have to run your fingers as fast as possible to move your horse. So I started play, designing that by controlling the sound of the horse hooves on the ground with how quickly your fingers were moving. So the faster you move, you know, if you start stopping moving very slowly, you just hear the horse walk, and then as you speed up, you hear it go from a trot to a gallop. And so this, so the faster you're moving your fingers, the faster the sound is. And I said, okay, I'll just make this into a, like a real race course game. So in your right speaker, you have one horse that you're racing against, and your left speaker, you have the other horse, and the center, kind of in the middle of your head, if you're wearing earbuds or headphones, you hear your own horse's hooves, and then you try to race against the other two horses. And I program the game that the other two horses are going to be within 90% to 110% of your speed. So it's a very competitive race. And I just said adding more and more race tracks to it. And that game's a lot of fun. So, and people said, you know, can you now do an ice, ice skating game and a swimming game and things like that? But using the same concept, you can – and a good uh, soundscape, you can make the game a lot of fun. And I found some sound clips out there for the announcement you know, with the horses getting to the starting gate and – passing by the quarter turn and the half turn. So between free sound clips and sound clips that I buy, it, you can um, the game becomes as rich in an audio environment as a, 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 a non-accessible game would be in a visual environment. So I'm totally blind myself, and I'm an Android user, and I'm getting really jealous. Have you thought about developing for Android? I have, but the reason I haven't is... is I've made the poor decision at the beginning to start everything on iOS, and while there are some cross-development platforms, um, they don't work as well when you're starting to push at different aspects of the phone, like the different movements a phone can do. I did a game, uh, a, a lot of the games, like Pong, have the phone swinging back and forth so you know where the paddle is, um, but I all went native iOS in every one of these things. Just happens to be that's where I started. I actually did a little Android development, but never did as much as iOS. So when I go look at at doing the, the same versions for Android, it would be like starting over from scratch. It's something I I know I should do at some point, but until I can make better penetration within the the iOS in phones in the United States, it's kind of silly to move into Android yet. Um, so I have to figure out how to solve the marketing problem first. And then that would give me enough basis to kind of pay somebody to rewrite all these games in, for Android. Because right. the average game, I, at this point, I have an infrastructure of the games, things like the setting screen or the help screen or things, screens to post to Facebook or Twitter, all that took months and months of development. And now I can basically do the framework of a game in about an hour. And then I spend the rest of the time right. tailoring just the aspect of that game. Um, to do to rewrite that whole infrastructure on Android would be is many months of development. Well, and I guess too, with so many different Android variations out there and running different OSs or versions of the OSs, that would make things a little trickier as well. It's not as bad as, as if it were a visually oriented game because then you have to deal with screen size. Right. So at least I avoid that problem. All I have to do is really know that I can pick up all the different gestures and that the gestures are sensible on the Android, for example, on the iOS, if you, if you put one finger down, you get the, the, um, the phone tells you somebody put one finger on the phone. If you now put a second finger down, it tells you, okay, now you have two fingers on the phone. And as you move your fingers around, it tells you where your fingers are. When you lift up one of those two fingers, but keep the other one on the phone, it no longer tells you that one, it, it basically acts like no fingers are on the phone. Mm. That caused a bunch of things that I tried to do not to work, but these, these little side conditions that you really have to worry about in whether or not the game is going to have a pleasant experience. The tolerance for failure on a game that you're building for somebody who can't see the screen is much lower than someone who can see the screen because the only feedback I have is whether or not what they're trying to do is succeeding and they don't know why it's not succeeding. So if it's not succeeding, they'll just give up. Right. Whereas in a sighted world, you would – 
aim your fingers on something and if you see something's not on but you do see your fingers on the screen and you move it around and you see the other thing isn't moving say okay let me try this again right in the visually impaired world it's like well this doesn't work you know forget it yeah right so that being said um do you find in terms of of developing accessible games or do you have do you put more emphasis on um the beta testers Oh, yeah. So, so every game will go through anywhere from six weeks to 10 weeks of beta testing. I think Monopoly, which we call Opoly, probably was out in beta test for almost four or five months because first I did the game and people said, take, uh, I looked at all the different types of Monopoly games that are out there normally and I, you know, took a look at one or two of the accessible ones. Um, but I wanted to do it different to really take advantage of the iPhone. So I did that, put it out there. Had the game framework in place for about six weeks, probably spent about three or four weeks on it. And then I didn't move ahead because I realized I did not have any good um, technology or, or code to do a good uh, comp uh, computer opponent. And I was looking and looking on the web for somebody who maybe they wrote a master's thesis on this or did something out of somebody who actually analyzed the game enough to say this is how a computer AI robot would play. And I kept looking, and finally I stumbled onto something. It was a master's thesis done by somebody in France back in, I think, September. In September, I found it. The master's thesis was probably written about 15 years ago or more, had it, had it translated, and then um, kind of wrote the code based around the thesis and put that out there and then kept refining it based on the feedback so that way the player – you're playing with other players who actually – are a real challenge to win. It's not just random. You're not just playing against random uh, people. So you can set it to be a player who's very smart, a player who's very greedy, a player who's very cautious. And that game has done quite well, you know, thousands and thousands of downloads. I'm a, I then did the other game that's been, the two games have been really popular that didn't require that type of advanced technology in the um, opponent were uh, Wheel of Fortune, because people seem to love TV games. And um, Jeopardy, which I put out there as trivia match, and then I'm about to release a version of Family Feud. Nice. So, so is there an option in any of your games to play against other members of the community? I did that originally. It took me. I did that in uh, Uno, which is called Blindfold Wildcard, and I did that in um, Crazy Eights, and I did that in Bowling. Um, None of those three games really have, I mean, whereas the games themselves had thousands and thousands of downloads, the versions that were for multiplayer maybe had under 100 downloads. So Interesting. And, and I put in literally months and months of time to get it right. It took me five to attempts to get it right to do a good multiplayer game, and but nobody really need, wanted it because I think the – the amount of time it takes you to find somebody to play against is not worth hanging out waiting for somebody to join you. Right. right. A bunch of the games are already multiplayer from RS games, and I did a project with them I think almost a year ago now where I wrote – I took a version of their web client, rewrote it as an iOS program. You know, to, we worked out a um, – an arrangement where we could do that together and we've now been working together where anyone who has an iPhone or an iPad – um, can play against anyone using RS games on any of the platforms they're already on, which is Windows and Mac. So they kind of cover a lot of those type of multiplayer games. They don't have bowling um, because that's their games aren't kind of screen and touch oriented. But most of the other games, like they have a great Monopoly game and things like, and they have, you know, they did a, a, a version of, um, oh. Um, Cards Against Humanity, oh, yeah. <laughs> which you have to play against other people. And if you play against a computer, it's just not that much fun. I've, I've looked at it and I've, I've seen versions of that for for sighted people on the App Store where you're playing against computer players. And just it's just not that much fun. So I decided not to pass on that one. And so what is the – like are your games free or is there a range of prices? All the games come come with a couple of dozen plays of free free plays. They're all free to download. They come with a couple of dozen free plays, and then you can upgrade for a dollar for a bunch more plays or 
most of the upgrades are between like three and seven dollars, depending on what you want. So with uh, Jeopardy trivia match, um, I sell each group of I think five thousand questions for about four dollars. Well. So did you find that once you sort of did all the heavy lifting of, of developing a framework and you, you built some soundscapes and you sort of had a, a bit of a handle on um, how, to, how to build accessible games, is the process faster? Like can you re reuse a lot of elements from game to game? I can reuse a lot, but the game itself I can't. So if I'm doing another card game, like I just did Euchre, and Euchre's – I didn't understand – how the game Euchre was played. And I read about it enough times on the web. It just made no sense. I found some online Euchre game out there. So I'm playing. I said, okay, I get it. So then I decided, well, I, could, I don't know how the computer opponent plays. So I contacted the guy who wrote this Euchre game. I said, can you send me a copy of your source code? I want to move it over to Blindfold Games um, and get it out there. And then, we, you know, I don't think it's going to make a lot of money because none of the games make a lot of money. But anything we make, we'll split half. We'll split fifty-fifty. So he he said, normally I don't give out my games, but since you're doing this and all, and you've done this for a while, he sent it to me. I was able to drop his game into my infrastructure for card games. Then it took me probably another two weeks of programming to get all his stuff to work. Now he's done about seven other games. Some are overlap with what I did. Some aren't overlap. But I think one or two of other of his other games now would also drop in pretty quickly since I did the hard work in both merging his stuff with my infrastructure and getting his stuff rewritten into um, something my infrastructure can handle. So I, I could probably add it. But for example, now I'm looking at. I've had a lot of requests for a a pet care game where you adopt a pet like a puppy and then you have it grow up. <laughs> And you have different tasks you have to do. You have to walk the pet, feed the pet, uh, clean up after the pet. Um, you, you'll buy things for the pet. Right. So pulling all the infrastructure and getting the basic game up and running of, of just screens that did nothing was easy. Now I have to figure, have to figure out how this game is going to work. And it's probably going to be about two, two hard weeks of programming to make the game fun. And then, you know, then it'll just be tailored around what the people tell me they want for um, – um, you know, features to make it even more enjoyable. But I did, I already found 50 or so uh, short sounds of dogs barking and eating and, and lapping up water and playing. So now I just kind of have to tie it all together. So on average, how long would you say an average from scratch game takes for the, from, from conception rate to completion? Well, um, the easiest game I've recently done is I did a game called Words from words where you basically take a word like, um, uh, what's a good word? What is it? Okay. Okay. For like the word comment. And then you want to see how many words you can get out of the word comment. So one of the words would be come, C-O-M-E. Another word would be 10, T-E-N. So I basically took my, my game called, um, word games, uh, peeled out a little piece of that and I was able to do words for words in about three days and then people, the testers gave me about a, half a dozen suggestions like coming up with a timed version, have the computer solve it so, so you could tell, you could compare yourself to the computer doing it. So I'll probably put another three days in. So the shortest game may be six or seven days. Wow. Longest games probably could be as much, much as six weeks. Well, wow. And I'm going to ask a geeky question. Um, what programming language do you use? It's all written in Objective C under iOS. I, I keep meaning to switch over to Swift, which is much faster for development. And I've kind of learned a little Swift, but uh, then I have to deal with the whole thing of moving my infrastructure, figuring out how to use my infrastructure from Swift. So I'm being lazy and avoiding it. <laughs> uh, why, why fix it if it ain't broke, right? Yeah, but I do know for you know that six days might drop down to four days if I didn't have to do everything <laughs> in Objective C. Um, and so, in general, how how has the reaction been from from the community? Um, everybody loves the game. Some people think they're too expensive. Some pe I, I think those are people who are on fixed income and have to make a real decision between how they spend you know what little funds they have. 
there's a bunch of people out there who, no matter what game I come up with, whether they like it or not, they want to support the game, so they get everything. It was a lot of fun. We did actually, in, in, co in coordination with Project Starfish, which is an organization that helps uh, provide job training and, and jobs for people with visual impairments. Um, I, I did a podcast with them, and then they came back and I said, can I have, I like what your, comp what your organization does, would you like to run a contest for me? So we did a championship for a race, for Blindfold Racer, where we had thousands of uh, game players from all over the world compete to see who got the higher scores. And I added about 25 more levels to the Blindfold Racer, and we did this, I think we started around September 1st and finished at the end of October, and had thousands of people following the contest, so that was that was a lot of fun. Wow. So, so is part of you surprised the fact that nobody has has really thought of this before? Well, other people have done it. Like Jim Kitchen did a slew of games on, on Windows. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. I've tried to get the source code to his games, working through his, both his brother and his sister after he passed away. Um, but there's all sorts of complexities there, so that hasn't happened yet. Uh, there's um, – well, RS Games has been out for a while – Spoonbill Software out in um, Australia it has a whole bunch of games, and I've been in contact with him, trying to convince him to partner with me the same <laughs> way I partnered with RS Games, but right. he's very reluctant to do that. But maybe you know he'll hear this podcast and he'll realize it's not such a bad idea. Uh, I actually, I just heard from a couple of people over in England who just got his 2020 cricket program, and they want a, a, an iPhone version of that. So I, I reached out to Ian again, said, you know, let's, let's work on this together. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not really surprised that nobody else has done this on iOS because everyone else who has jumped in ended up giving up after about a year or so. If you look at something else, the Papa Sangri product, mm -hmm. it, he, they did two very, very good products, but they could not afford to keep the products running under iOS because every time a new version of iOS comes out, you end up having to make some changes right. um, to your program. And if you're not getting any new sales, which, which they weren't, then you know, it, just starts, it just costs more and more money just to maintain it for, for no reason. And I think they end up selling their company to somebody else and, and focusing in a different area and they, they put all their source code up you know, in public domain. Um, what I decided is if you look at the app world in general, you have the only way to be successful in any sense is to come up with something new every every few weeks. <laughs> and even if you have a bunch of failures, you'll have a bunch of successes. And, and if you have a common infrastructure, the successes will end up pay for the failures. And you know, I think my my worst games probably had 500 downloads and my best games probably had about seven to 8,000 downloads. So while that's not a lot in the overall I iOS world. It is a reasonable percentage of the iOS world for visually impaired people. Right. Well, and the excellent thing is you've got a wide variety of games that you know would appeal to a, a very wide audience. So I think you're doing a, a great thing there. Yeah, it's. Um, I need to run another survey again. I did a survey about a year ago. I need to do another one to ask people what they want next because inevitably what people want next isn't necessarily what they download. I, I found that. So, right. But I think I, I got – I think Monopoly was the number one game that was requested at, and Jeopardy and um, Wheel of Fortune were up there in the top three. And I'm not, the two others that I know have had a lot of requests for, I haven't done them yet, is goalball and baseball. And I haven't done them yet only because I did a basketball expecting it to be – kind of popular and it was a complete flop i did soccer which i expect to be popular but it was a flop and um you know maybe gold ball or, or baseball will be more successful because there are equivalents in the visually impaired world with beat baseball and i know people follow that so one of these days i'll do that but again it's you know kind of got burned a little on those other two sports programs so i'm not sure whether it'll end up you know be something people wanted but not not something they'd actually spend time playing Oh, you need something like wheelchair rugby or sledge hockey, a little bit of violence thrown in. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let me ask you this. Um, where do most of the ideas for the games come from? Does it come from, from your audience a lot? Yeah, definitely from the audience. So if, if people who are listening to this podcast have ideas for games, please have them email me at marty at blindfoldgames.org. Great. 
And I want to ask you as well, you also have another URL, Kid Friendly Software. Where did that come from? That was actually the uh, the re- that's the real company's name. Okay. Um, and that's the one we, when I did the the wish to list um, birthday wish list app. I wanted to come up with the name of a company that was kind of meant something if I was going to do more and more apps that are in the STEM world. Um, so I did kid friendly software, and then I also published um, another. Uh, for a while there, I had a a safe browser that I built under um, for the iPhone uh, because I had another company I started which had software for the PC that would watch what a teen was doing or, or a kid was doing online on this PC so parents could keep the kids safe on the internet. Um, and that was published with kid-friendly software. So uh, I basically decided to kind of repurpose that company, but as far as the games, I wanted to brand it with something that people would remember and that's where Blindfold Games came from. And the name Blindfold actually came from one of the, the one of the kids at Miami Lighthouse for the Blind came up with uh, the concept of Blindfold, and then we looked at Blindfold Driver and a few other things, but they liked Racer the best. It is actually a really, really good time for this because more and more, with all the, the built-in accessibility features of you know iPhones, iPads, more and more visually impaired people have smartphones, you know, in their possession. And, you know, g- games like this, they're, they're perfect, right? Well, it, it's interesting because I want to understand what the demographics were of my audience. So a year ago when I asked people what games they wanted me to do next, I asked them, you know, how old are you? Um, how many minutes a day do you play the games? Things like that. And I had about 500 people answer. And I had an equal distribution of people from 7 to 70 years old. And wow. people were pe- playing on average about 30 minutes a day. So you know, I guess it's the, the games are pretty good. I don't know. I, uh, somebody once said I'm responsible. I'm more responsible for visually impaired people wasting time than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's always been one of those things where, you know, sitting on a bus or waiting for a train or sitting on a plane, you know, you want or in a doctor's office, you want to be able to just pull up a short game, maybe play a level or two while you're waiting. Um, you know, it's another alternative to just sitting there listening to music or, you know, watching Netflix. So power to you. Let me ask this. I've been, um, I've been toying with the idea of, of converting over one of the interactive fiction apps. Do you, do you guys ever play those like the old adventure game or anything? Mm-hmm. Or Frost? I don't know if you've seen that game, that, uh, interactive fiction app. Have you done those? Uh, I haven't, but have you, Ryan? The text, text fiction games I've played a little bit. Do you like them? <sighs> No, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, I'm probably, well, I shouldn't say I'm not your demographic. I've just never really found myself. I'm interested in games yet when I download them and I sit to play them, uh, you know, I play them maybe once or twice a week and then I don't play them for a month on end. They just kind of sit on my phone. Um, so I'm just not really, you know, your avid game player. Yeah, I mean, I would say the majority of of people who download the games would not consider themselves game players. There is, you know, there are a couple of forums of people who just were avid game players and they like a lot of RPG games. Um, but I think the majority of people who were, um, you know, the majority of, of the people who like my games um, are not role player games. Um, there is probably a large community. I don't know how many thousands of people who, who are visually impaired and love the role playing games. But the, the issue of why I've never tackled one of those is it takes a lot of time and energy and, and excellent audio engineers and, right. and things like that to make it to be really good. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's also just the platform that you're building it on is, is a bit of a difference because I think, you know, on a, when you're, when you're developing a game for a smartphone, say, Gen- in general, people probably only want you know, you know something that's going to take them 15 minutes. They're not in it for the long haul because, like Ryan said, they're waiting for the bus or they're sitting in a waiting room or they're you know killing some time while you know doing something else. So you know, short short gameplay is sort of appeals to smartphone users, it seems. Whereas something like an RPG that would be more suited for maybe maybe the iPad or a computer, right? Yeah, I, I tend to agree. People are looking for a fast game where each round of the game can be over in, in three to five minutes. And, 
you know, probably Monopoly is is deviates from that. But the thing is, with Monopoly, you can play a few, you know, play a few turns, come back to it, and, mm-hmm. and the game continues to improve. Right. Now, have you looked at any of the games from GMA games that used to be around? Like they had Tank Commander and Sarah and the Castle of Witchcraft and Wizardry and. No, let me write that down. They were. Well, you- any idea what language they were written in? Was that in um, BGT or something like that? Uh, no idea. No idea. Uh-huh. But the audio quality was really high quality. You know, I, I can tell you they probably hired a pretty decent audio engineer. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, I don't know if they're still around or not. But Tank Commander, uh, Sarah in the Castle of Witchcraft and Wizardry. They also had a gun shooter or a gunslinger game as well. I forget what that was called. Uh, but it was GMA Games. Okay. I'll do a search on the see if I can find it. it would be, I mean, if I can find really the source code to that, who, who currently owns that, maybe I can do right. uh, that, a collaboration with them. Yeah, the, the, the Sarah Castle of Witchcraft one was kind of loosely based on the Harry Potter series, so it was kind of fun. Uh, and so the sense I get that you're pretty much an army of one, is that right? I mean, it, I have an army of one, yes. <laughs> um, it, I, I've been trying to look for uh, some advertisers to support this, and, but not the type of advertisers you see on like RS Games, but really a, a large company to get behind it who want to have access to the community that likes my games, and I'm still working on that from a business perspective. Right. Uh, and that could finance, you know, more people or moving it over to the Android or whatever, but that's still, you know, work in progress. So with your games, are they do they scale automatically for iPhone, iPad, or are there two separate games? In every game except bowling, it scales automatically. And the reason I had bowling done differently was I was contemplating moving it over to the Apple TV because at, at some point I had a lot of requests for that. Hmm. Um, so I did that. So I first got it running on. So first, first I did bowling. Then I had to redo bowling to use only Apple related things for a physics engine. And then to do that, I had to do separately for the iPhone and the iPad. And then I was then going to do Apple TV, but the number of people who are visually impaired who own an Apple TV is fairly small. Mm-hmm. So I kind of shelved that. I still have an old Apple. I have an Apple TV, the newer one, sitting on my shelf, sitting in a box, because I haven't hooked up for development, and I'm too lazy to <laughs> replace my old Apple TV with that. I'm going to have to log in and all, and you know, find all my preferences. So yeah. one of these days, you bet I'll sell it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> When you first started out developing uh, the the accessible games, I don't know what was the what was the biggest hurdle that you had to sort of clear. Like, what was the big thing that was the biggest learning curve for you? Um, it was like one learning curve after another. You're know, figuring out how to use voiceover, figuring, figuring out how to use the screen without um, voiceover getting in the way, figuring out how to drive the voiceover engine. Dealing with every time Apple would come out with a new version of the operating system, their their text to voice systems would change. Um, coming up with screen, coming up with gestures that would be sufficiently consistent across games, so I, so people would have a smaller learning curve. So it's like every month there's something new. So do you find that like does does the the built-in accessibility stuff? Do you find that you're constantly fighting with that, like, or or have you got that all figured out now? Even in iOS nine and ten, if you put the, the a game into like direct touch mode, and then you pop up a voice assisted screen, it doesn't always pop up as voice assisted, and then when you go back to the game, it doesn't always go back into direct access mode, and then if you go back to a main menu, it doesn't always go back to voice assisted mode. So there are slews of tricks that I've tried here and there, but this is actually something Apple broke, and, and not enough people have complained for them to fix it because most people don't realize it's broken. Right. And so are your games self-voicing, or do they use voiceover? All of them, are, all of them use text-to-voice. Um, they don't use voiceover. In some very few games where I use voiceover, I have to use the keyboard. So, for example, in Wheel of Fortune... When you're picking uh, the letters, I'll pop up a screen where you type in a letter using you know, either a Bluetooth or a, a Bluetooth keyboard or a, a Braille display or typing right on the screen. If you're typing right on the screen, it'll be in voiceover, so you know what you're typing. Um, but when you go back to the main screen of like spinning the wheel and doing other things, you're in a direct access screen using um, text-to-voice. Self-voice. Right. 
Oh, I was just thinking I took my iPad home yesterday, so I'm going to have to go home tonight and actually download some games and give them a shot. Well, I think you'll enjoy it. And, um, you know, you, uh, what kind of games do you like the best? I can give you a recommendation. Um, I really like the blackjack games. I usually have blackjack on just about every phone I, I've had. <clears throat> excuse me, I've had. So I'll probably download the blackjack game. Yeah, uh, then, then after blackjack, if you like that genre of games, you know, go for video poker, which starts out with video poker, then have a bunch of dealer poker games where you're playing against um, the dealer in a, in a poker. Like, it's not like um, uh, Texas Hold'em, but it's, there's like five different dealer poker games that are fun. Um, I also have craps, I have roulette. Um, and craps, I didn't realize it's such a complex game, but you can play craps at either a simple level or the really complex level. Or roulette, which has both French and American wheels and has a whole variety of different types of wheels. So Right. Yeah, so I'll give Blackjack a shot. Um, I'm interested in the trivia as well, so I'll download the, the trivia game. Yeah. And just a couple of other ones just to play with them. And... Yeah. Yeah, so well, I hope you have fun with them. Well, I'm sure I will. Yeah, if he's in, if he's in late tomorrow, I'll know why. It's because he's up till four o'clock playing blackjack. That's right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, a couple other things then before we wrap it up. Um, where can people find you on the web or or in the app store? Okay, in the app. Well, the easiest way to find the games is go to blindfoldgames.org, and there's a a page there which is you know games we make. On the app store, they could look for kid friendly software, or they can just do a search on blindfold games or blindfold in the specific game they're looking for will come up to reach me it's marty at blindfoldgames.org uh, my my um blog is at blindfoldgames.org and my twitter is is hash uh or at blindfold games and are you always looking for for more beta testers if, if somebody wants to to yes I'm always looking for more beta testers. So. Okay, fantastic. So if anyone's yeah looking to get early access to some games and, and help Marty develop them, reach out. That'd be great. All right, Marty. Well, listen, I want to thank you very much for, for joining us today. Um, it was great. Well, thank you. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing what you got coming up next. Actually, speaking of which, maybe I'll ask you one more, one last question. Can you tell us at all what you're working on right now? Well, see, I'm just about to release Family Feud. It will be called Blindfold Feud. <laughs> um, what else? And then I'm just going to start on this pet care game. Right. Is, um, I think Ryan. Then, I think I Ryan. Done, I haven't done another gambling game for a while, but I'm kind of running out of ideas for gambling games. I don't want to do a slot machine because there's so many slot machines out there already. <laughs> um, but and I've done almost everything else except for baccarat. I don't think that many people play baccarat. Kino is a pretty boring game. Um, yes. Have you done Texas Hold'em? No, because there's a good poker game out there already that does that. Okay. And I think Texas Hold'em is much better if you're playing against real people. Right. And all my games kind of just, you just play against computer opponents. So I, uh, again, I have to think about that. That mm. maybe I'll do that one if I can find. Um, a good computer strategy for Hold'em. I mean, that's the real issue is the game itself is easy, but you need a strategy for your, your opponents. Have you done a classic hangman game? Mm, yes, actually. In, in Blindfold Word Games is a hangman game. Okay. As, as is Boggle. And I also put Boggle out under its own name called Biggle. Biggle. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, can... I, I did seven words. That's, in, that's, in, um, that's out there. So I have a lot of word games. Right. Yeah, I can see it in Ryan's face. He's pretty excited about the pet care one. <laughs> uh, we shall see. We shall see. All right, Marty, thanks so much again for joining us. Sure thing. And uh, we'll we'll reach out and we'll talk again. Okay, thank you. Okay, Marty, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, he had a lot to say. He did. That was yeah, good. That, was, that was actually really interesting. Um, the development process of... Uh, you know what surprises me is the speed that he seems to be able to to crank these games out. Well, I think, like you said, once you have a basic framework for a game, you're basically just you know plugging other stuff in and adjusting it accordingly, right? So once you have the framework done, it's it seems like that's the biggest hurdle is just developing that initial framework. I suppose when you're developing something like a card game, I mean the programming behind it is fairly similar between it's just the rules that you have to tweak. So I, I guess I could see that. But still, I mean developing an, a game app in six days yeah. is crazy. 
<laughs> yeah, it really is. He seems to really know his stuff. Yep. Well, you're going to have to go away and download some of these and uh, give us a give us a report. You got to break out your old iPhone, I guess. No, I've got my iPad at home. I don't have an iPhone anymore. I sold it to Rick's daughter. Oh, did you? Yeah. Yeah, that's why I was asking if he'd develop for Android because, you know, I've got an Android Nexus 7 at home. I've got an Android phone. You know, I'd love to have more Android games because there's not a lot of them out there. Right. Nobody else seems to be really doing it. No, you know, that's the thing. You know, and it's a really, it's an untapped industry and, and more and more visually impaired people. I mean, almost everybody, every every visually impaired person that we know, certainly they, they have smartphones. Yeah. So Most I think, of them are iOS, but, you know, that's slowly changing. It is. But so I see nothing but, uh, you know, a road paved with gold for, for Marty. I mean, I, I think the industry is going nowhere but up. Well, and I think if the quality of games is high enough as well, you can charge four bucks for a game. Yep. You know, I spent four dollars on Pocket Cast or whatever it's called. Right. You know, the podcast app. Right. You know, and I've used free ones before, which I really liked. But since I've been using Pocket Cast the last couple of weeks, um, it's worth the four bucks. Well, and you know you what know? you know what I really like too about his model is that it it gives you free plays as opposed mm-hmm. to you know, intrusive ads. Yeah. Like there's nothing worse that you download a free game and then it's just filled with ads or it's filled with limitations. Mm -hmm. I would rather, you know, it gives you 10 free plays so you can try it out. You can play it. If you like it, then you buy it. Yeah. And that's the, that's the, uh, that's the way to go. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So where can people find us, Ryan? People can find us online at www.atbanter.com. They can also email us at atbanterpodcast at gmail.com. Dot com. And they can find us on YouTube. They can find, don't say it. They can find us on Twitter. Facebook. Not Instagram. We're everywhere. Although we should think about getting an Instagram account. I thought about it too. The last week and a half, I've been thinking about it. Okay. Well, we'll have to talk off mic about that because we might, we we may need, although then we have to figure out what what we're going to take pictures of. The studio. (laughs) Certainly (laughs) not our our ugly face. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is a picture of a microphone. This is my workstation at the moment. (laughs) This is Rob. See, that's the thing. What are we going to, I don't know. Well, I'm sure there's some pretty crappy Instagram accounts out know. there, so I don't know. I'll have to do some research on that. Studio, that TV. Next thing you know, we'll come in and the place will be robbed. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Thanks for letting us know all the stuff you've got in your that's studio. Right. Yep. All right. Anyways, uh, all right. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks, everybody, for listening. I have been Robin O. And I've been Ryan Flurry. And we will see you all next week. This podcast has been brought to you by Aroga Technologies. Visit Aroga Technologies online at www.aroga.com. That's A-R-O-G-A.com. Music provided by bensound.com.